God, uh, as we assemble. And when I say house of God, I'm not talking about the name of our church. I'm talking about house of God. As we assemble to worship together, I'd like to extend a welcome also to our uh, uh, viewing or virtual audience, those of you who are watching this via live stream or video. We're grateful that you carved out time to uh, be a part of this worship experience. And, uh, it's good to see all of you. I think uh, some of you may uh, have not been able to come out in person in a while, but it's good to see you. And uh, most of all, we're just grateful for the presence of God. Uh, we know that he's here because he, he assured us that we're two or three are assembled together in his name, he would be in the midst. So we're glad that he's here. And because he's here, something good's gonna happen in our midst. And uh, I just want to invite you to open your hearts and minds up to the Spirit of God and invite him to, to do whatever he desires to do. Engage his presence. Uh, as the worship team comes and leads in, in song here in a few moments, just want to invite you to engage his presence. Um, there are a couple of announcements I want to make, and I'm going to pray. <clears throat> One is um, um, we're having communion, as you probably can see, uh, a little bit later. And for those of you who are at home watching via video or live stream, stream you uh, are welcome to get some elements together now, bread, wafer, cracker, some juice, so that you can be a part of uh, the communion experience a little bit later. Also, um, um, we, the teaching pastor Brian and I have been teaching and, and focusing on the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light for the past several weeks. And, um, you know, we have a, a lot of space of time each Sunday, so uh, you don't get to cover everything. And I realize there are questions that, have, have, uh, that may come up and have come up, and we want to be able to uh, respond to your questions. So. Uh, what we're going to do um, uh, is prepare some little uh, simple cards that you can write out your questions on, and those should be available next Sunday. Uh, but in the meantime, you, you can go to the, uh, uh, you can email the questions in, as well to the church's email address. I don't know if that's on the screen or not, but uh, uh, you, can, you, can, you can get your questions to us that way, and that gives us an opportunity to respond, because what we want is to remove if, if, if all barriers if possible, and uh, so that um, you're able to uh, uh, embrace the, what God is saying and 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 uh, incorporate it into your daily rhythm of life. Um, and also, uh, Pastor Brian mentioned last week that um, uh, as a part of um, the the month that's been designated in our nation to kind of uh, commemorate uh, African American history, and also an, as an extension of the conversations we've been having as a con as, as congregations, uh, especially during the summer of last year. There's a link on uh, Emmanuel's website that uh, gives you access to additional resources related to the African American experience, and we're invited to go and just to, to dig in as much as you'd like, uh, and hopefully that. Just broadens uh, your insight and understanding of uh, your brothers and sisters who look like me. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Father, thank you <clears throat> for this time and this day that you have made, and we rejoice. We're glad, God, that you included us in this day. Uh, we, we celebrate you and, and who you are. God, as creator, as redeemer, as Lord, as savior, as father, as friend, as healer, as provider. You're all those things, God. But most of all, we get to call you Abba, Dad. Thank you for being our father. Thank you for following us the way that you in this moment, God, we're wanting you, we know you're here, but we're wanting you to feel like you belong here. Um, we have folk out in the lobby, Kenya, today, specifically, who greet people as they come in, and, and 
endeavoring to make them feel like they belong here. And we want everybody to feel that way. But God, most of all, we want you to feel like you belong here, God. You're wanted in this space. And so, as we worship and we sing, God, as we just open our hearts to you, we invite you to receive our praise and, and, and just tabernacle, manifest yourself in our presence. Because we're here for you. We're here to hear what you want to say to us. We're here to, to be touched by you, God, where we are hurting you. We're here to experience your love. So we welcome you into this space. And we invite you, oh God, to move upon our hearts. Each one that's present, each one that's participating virtually. Move upon our hearts, God. Let make your presence known. Yeah, you're here, but make your presence known. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Ah, good. Well, we are here to worship, and I'm just going to share from Colossians just briefly. So as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. So this morning, as we rise and we sing, I thought that is a good verse for us to think on, that we are rooted in him, that we are praising him, that we are here to honor and to worship. So we will sing, Oh, praise the name of Jesus. And it sort of tells a story. It sort of tells a story. And um, then we will... One second. Thanks, Tom, for that reminder. Uh, it will tell a story, Oh, praise the name, as we celebrate. But then... Also, we will be singing at the cross, and that will continue that focus on Lent and the sacrifice for us. So let's stand, everybody. Let's begin with, oh, praise the name.
Hallelujah and thank you. death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, or height, or depth, or anything else will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
At the cross, Lord, you paid it all for us. We come before you now as individuals and corporately, for you have called us your beloved. You have called us sons or daughters. You have given us our heritage in you. We lift you up and we praise you and we thank you. We come to celebrate your life. We come this morning to take your body and your blood and to claim you once again. Lord Jesus, move through this place. Holy Spirit, flow through us and over us and in us that we know whom we are meeting with right now. We welcome your presence. We honor your presence. We glorify you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Be seen, be heard, be acknowledged, and be glorified in this place. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I want to add my welcome to that of Pastor Sam. Did I turn this on? Yeah, I got a light. There we go. There we go. Um, great to see each of you today. We're here today celebrating Jesus Christ. Uh, we're going to do that in communion, remembering his death and resurrection for us. And because of his resurrection, we have new life. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 All right. All right. Um, as a church, we did this thing called the $10 Challenge. And uh, last week, Loria took it because she was going to get into a rumble with uh, Kenya. Uh, but they, they, they agreed to, to just let her have it. So, Lori, why don't you tell us what you did with the $10 challenge? Sure. Um, I'll use my mic up there. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. I, uh, I got a share. I had shared last week um, that it was for a family in my school um, with a couple children, the, old, the oldest being in fourth grade, um, and then youngers. Uh, the, the mother who was a previous student of mine when I taught in the middle school, um, and now I have their children. Uh, I'm getting into round twos. I don't know if I want to go to round threes. <laughs> but anyway, um, sadly, she took her own life and left her children. And the father is not involved. There's a grandma and her brother, who I also know, um, so sadly, those kids have not been in school this past week, of course, um, but they'll be returning on Monday. And the, the $10 challenge is specifically for the needs of the children, like whatever they may have a need for in the near future. Um, I will give it to the brother who I know well, Brandon, and just let him kind of oversee what those kids need. Um, the school has set up a... Um, you know, one of these uh, fundraisers on Facebook to pay for the costs of the immediate funeral, things like that. But anyway, to get to the blessings that you provided, um, I think I left with about 240 maybe, and then I received two mails of $20 each, and then another person handed me money, and then I contributed, so, um, we are over three hundred and twenty dollars to give to that family. So, so um, I just really appreciate it. The the brother and his family they are believers, born again. Um, so I know that I will be able to say to them, you know, this is with love from people at Emmanuel Church to bless those kids with whatever they're going to. Maybe, maybe it's just going to be something fun. I don't know what it's going to be. Maybe it's going to be a pay for play or something. I don't know what it will be, but I'll just trust um, Brandon and his family to know that. So thank you very much for um, making that um, offering into that family so they know that there's people wider than their circle that care about them. Thank you. Amen. 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 Thank you, Maria. It's a great story. So I'd like to give away another hundred dollars today. Um, who would like to take the hundred dollar challenge today? 
Anyone? All right, Jess will. Here you go, Jess. And have fun with it. All right. Well, I'd like to invite each of you to pray with me. Um, and we'll, we'll speak blessings to God for what he has blessed us with. Um, out in the lobby are offering buckets for both House of God and Emmanuel. If you want to bring your offering, put them in there. Uh, also, you know, in our weekly email, there is instructions for how to give online. Um, so there's different ways you can be giving during this season. So let's pray together. Great and glorious God, we thank you that you own the cattle on a thousand hills, and we don't. And you, God, you're the generous giver. You've blessed us in so many wonderful ways. We are rich. And today we want to be, we want to be givers like you and return to you um, out of the blessings you've given to us. So we give these offerings to you, whether they're here in the, the buckets or whether they're online. We give our offerings to you because we love you and we acknowledge all that we have, all that we are, comes to us from you. And we celebrate you, O oh God. Um, and we celebrate that we can be a, a, a people who go forth from this place and bless others, especially those who are in a difficult spot, who are hurting. And we thank you for Loria who went out uh, this past week in the name of Jesus to come alongside this grieving family with these kids who have been devastated by the loss of their mother and, and, and the, the tragedy that, that she took her own life. It's just, just a horrific situation all around. Uh, but God, you are present. You are in the midst of that. Jesus, you said you'd be with us always, even to the end of time. And you're in the midst of those kinds of situations. And we pray that this family would be aware of your love, of your devotion to them, of your compassion for them, of your comfort. Oh, Holy Spirit, you are the comforter. Uh, and we pray that you would come alongside this family with your comforting presence and speak compassion to them, speak life to them, speak assurance to them, yeah. that they would know that there is a God in heaven above there, there's a God on this earth who loves them yeah. and is watching out for them and caring for them. Yeah. Thank you, God, that we can be a blessing in that way. And we pray your anointing on Jess as she goes out this week and she helps someone. We just pray that your Holy Spirit would give her the words that she needs to speak, that your Holy Spirit would be upon her and within her in ways that bring renewal not only to her but to somebody else, and that she would have the, this, um, this, the, this gravitational force uh, upon her and within her that people are drawn towards you through what she does this week. So we pray your blessing on her. Thank you, God, that we can be in your presence this morning. We give you honor, we give you glory. In your name we pray, amen. At this time, our dear sister Kenya is going to come and read scripture for us. delivered us from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins thank you for the reading of the word and i'm going to ask you all if you will join me in prayer those who are able to um god has asked us to shift shift a little bit because prayer is also a form of worship so those of you that can join me in Bowing, bending, um, please do so. If you can't, don't worry about it. But um, I was disobedient last week, last time I prayed. Um, and God is just asking that we would shift our posture. Shift our posture. We've stood in his presence. We've sat in his presence. And those of us that can bow in his presence as we pray, please do. Please do. Father, in the name of Jesus, first of all, God, we just want to say thank Thank you for this day. Thank you for the sun shining. Thank you for keeping and protecting us. Thank you that we are able to be in your presence. Father, we have stood in your presence. We have sat in your presence. And now we are bowing in your presence. For you are worthy of our bow. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our worship. And we thank you on today. Father, we surrender it all to you at the cross. 
at the cross where the where the, your blood ran red. We thank you, Jesus. We bow before you, thanking you, Lord, for taking us out of darkness. Taking us out of the darkness in the name of Jesus and into your marvelous light, God. We surrender all to you on today. We magnify you. We lift you up. We thank you for redeeming us. It was your blood that redeemed us, and we thank you for it. For it's not anything that we've done in and of ourselves, but it was your blood, Jesus. And for that, we say thank you. Thank you, God, for sending your only begotten son to for our sins. He didn't do anything wrong. It was all on us. But because of your blood, because of your love, you sacrificed your only son. Thank you for being the lamb. The Lamb of God that was slain for me. Hallelujah. I bless you. I magnify you. I thank you because we are sons and daughters. We are in your kingdom. We sit next to you in the name of Jesus. You call us righteousness. You call us holy. You call us your sons, your daughters. You call us beloved. And for that, we say thank you. Father, we ask that you have your way in this place on today. Move how you want to move. Say what you want to say, God. But God, we just ask that our praise, our worship will be a sweet smelling fragrance in your nostrils on today. Move in this place, God. Set captives free. Lift heavy hearts, God. Give understanding where there is none, God. Give clarity where there's confusion. Give hope where there is hopelessness in the name of Jesus. Bring healing where there is sickness in the name of Jesus. Father, we invite you in this place. Not this building, but our bodies in the name of Jesus. Have your way, God, in this place. We love you. We thank you. We magnify you. We need you. We need you like never before. In the name of Jesus. And for that, we say thank you for meeting our need. The need of your presence. The need of your love. The need of your grace. The need of your mercy. We love you. We need you. We thank you. Have your way in this place. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. sharing from the Word of God for us this morning from Colossians 1. Um, I want to read a story for you. Uh, it's in a book that I'm reading by Martin Laird called Into the Silent Land. And he writes a story about a ballerina, and I want to read this story for you. The woman could blow like silk across the stage or drive like a storm through the corps de ballet. To watch this world-class ballerina was to behold light and grace in human form. But if you'd ask her about her own experience as a source of beauty and inspiration, you would see only a vacant stare of shocked disbelief. She would speak instead of an obsessive and torturously perfectionist mind that left her grinding her teeth. She described her inner state as a series of internal videos that constantly played and that she constantly watched. Her attention was routinely stolen by them. What were these videos that played in her head? Usually something about how she wasn't quite up to standard. Not just regarding ballet, but any aspect of her this accompanied another series of videos concerning her intense anger. The anger registered in her body as a clenched jaw and a physique completely free of any suggestion of fat. Deeper than the anger, though, was the fear. Fear of what the critics might say of her dancing. Fear that her husband might wake up one day and decide to leave her. Fear of being alone. There were a lot of videos about pain. The most debilitating concerned some very old pain from childhood. 
One day, her mother walked into her bedroom as she sat looking at herself in the mirror. The mother said to her, I hope you don't think you're beautiful. She was indeed beautiful in every season of life. As a young girl, an adolescent, a young adult, a mature woman, she was beautiful. But this beauty became a gag knotted behind her, for she believed she was ugly. When as a teenager she won a highly prized scholarship to study ballet, her mother said, why would they give you that? Everybody knows that you've got two left feet. And so, although she has danced to great acclaim all over the world, she believes she's a klutz with two left feet. All of this plays in her head. Even if she isn't watching the video and pressing rewind to watch it again, and then again, and yet again, the video still plays in the background, like that dirge music in malls. This video was the cage that kept her running in tight circles. So, through the last couple of months, Pastor Sam and I have been preaching about the kingdoms of light and the kingdom of darkness. Um, and, and so we're looking at this phrase from Colossians 1, the dominion of darkness today, and what that is, is about. We've learned that in the kingdom of God, it is about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit from Romans 14, verse 17. And through the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at the kingdom of darkness and what that is about. And in the kingdom of darkness, there is a prince of darkness who is the ruler of the darkness, and his name is Satan. And Satan comes after us in the dominion of darkness through fear, intimidation, accusation, lies. And he comes after us because he's trying to destroy, trying to ruin the work that God has done in you. Because Satan knows that you have a testimony. Satan knows that Jesus is victorious. Satan knows that when you put your trust in him, in, or when you put your trust in Jesus, that you are redeemed and you are released from the darkness. And so that you have a testimony, a, a testimony that can be shared with other people and brings renewal and life to other people. A testimony that is proclaimed that Jesus is Lord. Satan knows that you have a testimony, and he wants to shut that testimony down. And so he goes after us to ruin us, to destroy us. And so that's what we looked at the last couple of weeks of how, what, we, or what is his strategy of trying to ruin us. And we looked at the fear and the intimidation and the lies and the accusations. Well, there is a dominion of darkness, but there's also the kingdom of the sun. So th these verses from Colossians are, are part of a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote about 55 AD. So we're talking like 25 years or so after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So pretty close to that event, that significant event. And he writes a letter to a local church in a small town of Coloss. Coloss is located on the Lycus River which is in what was called back then Asia Minor, but today we call it Turkey. And the Lycus River is an east-west river that, that drains towards the, the coast of the sea. And uh, about two or three hundred years before Christ, Colos was a booming city, very wealthy. The textile industry and trade was really booming at that time, and it, it was kind of a hub of economic activity in that region. But then, um, by the first century, uh, the, the status of Colossus was kind of diminished. It, it, it got smaller because Rome planted two new cities in the Lycus River Valley, Hierapolis and Laodicea. Um, and, and Rome really invested in, in those two cities to build them up and, and made them uh, official Roman cities. So Laodice or sorry, Colossus just kind of starts to ceases to be a big city and becomes kind of a small town by the time of Jesus. Uh, about 200 years before Jesus, um, 
Jewish people were resettled there during the diaspora. And uh, so by the time of Jesus, the Jewish population in Colossus was a significant minority population there. So um, Paul, at, at one point, is living in the city of Ephesus, which is on the coast. And he sends out a man named Epaphras to go plant a church in Colossus. And we read about this in, in Colossians 1 verse 7, that, that Epaphras is the one who planted this church. Um, and Epaphras would come back to Paul in Ephesus and give reports of what's going on. And, and Paul writes about this in, um, in Colossians 1 verses 3 to 6, these reports that he's receiving of how they're growing in spiritual faith and, and development and they're trusting in Jesus. And, and when you read these words of Paul, you can tell that there's a fondness and affection in his heart for these people in Colossus. And, and the church in Colossus it is made up of, of Jewish people who have put their faith in Jesus as, as Messiah, but also non-Jews who have trusted as Jesus as, as Messiah, Lord and Savior. And, and there's a real fondness, affection in Paul. And in fact, um, in, in verses 9 through 14, Paul writes down what he is praying for them. He's praying for their growth, for their development, that they know the, the truth and reality of Jesus Christ in their life. And by the time he gets to verse 12, he says that he's giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. Remember, uh, back about a month ago, we talked about our inheritance from being part of the kingdom of God. When you're in the kingdom of God, you receive an inheritance. And, and Paul is giving thanks to God that these people in class, they have received an inheritance in Christ. And he's celebrating and giving thanks to God for that. And then that brings up the verses 13 to 14 that Kenya read for us, which is a declaration of what God has done for us rescuing us from the dominion of darkness and bringing us into the kingdom of the sun he loves. So what is this dominion of darkness that, that Paul refers to here? Well, if you read the message translation by Eugene Peterson, um, that phrase, dominion of darkness, he translates it as dead-end alleys and dark dungeons. Dead-end alleys and dark dungeons. You are rescued from a dead end alley. You're rescued from a dark dungeon. So back to the story of the ballerina. She's living in a dungeon. Her own dark dungeon in her mind. And all these videos keep playing over and over uh, because of incidents that have gone on in her life. And, and Satan used the words that were spoken against her to grab a hold of her and, and tie her down. And, and that created all kinds of inner turmoil, emotional turmoil, mental turmoil, but also behavioral. She's in a dungeon in her soul. So Satan has her living in fear, fear of rejection, fear that one day her husband will wake up and go, I've had enough of this. I'm out of here. Fear of being accused that she's not enough that she has half an ounce of fat on her body, that her performances aren't perfect, that the critics will attack her. So she lives in fear. She's living life on this planet, but she's not in freedom. She's bound up. She keeps hitting a dead-end alley. That's the dominion of darkness. That's Satan's strategies going after her, um, put planting the seeds of fear and intimidation in her, speaking lies and accusations against her, so she looks at herself and think, believes that she is less than and unworthy. The results of that kind of activity of Satan in, in the ballerina, but also in us. Because Satan's not just going after the ballerina that I read about. He's going after all of us. And the results of that is he's just trying to ruin us. Trying to destroy us. Ruin us personally, internally. So we live with discouragement and despair, feelings of hopelessness and loneliness. The fear, the shame, the anxiety, that, that's what Satan is doing. So he's trying to ruin us internally so that our belief about ourselves is that we are not worthy, we're not lovable, 
We're not acceptable. And, and when we have that kind of stuff going on inside of us, we show up in relationships and we bring that with us into relationships. So for the ballerina, she shows up having to prove herself, prove that she's good enough to, to, to perform. But at the end of the performance, she still feels, eh, I didn't really get it. So she shows up with an intensity, an intensity in her performance, going after something. It's never enough. But when you think of this, this, this woman, and, and you know, she's living in a constant state of fear, fear of rejection. How do you think she shows up in her marriage with her husband? Is she trusting him? Or is she suspicious of him? Suspicious. So what Satan does is he, he plants these lies in, in you and in me because if he can ruin me personally, internally, it's also going to ruin my relationships because I'm, I'm going to bring that ruin inside of me into relationships. And I'm not going to trust people. I'm not going to let people love me. I'm not going to love others. I'm not going to show compassion to people. Because I am feeling all this inner turmoil, because the ballerina is feeling all this inner turmoil, because you feel the inner turmoil, then, then that comes with you into relationships, and it ruins and destroys relationships. And we get nitpicky of people. We blame people. Or maybe we just avoid, avoid the situation, evade things. Maybe we get really domineering. For, for me, one of my go-tos is being very intellectual and using my intellect to, to kind of pick at someone and, and prove them wrong. Those are all dysfunctional behaviors. They're all hurtful. Hurtful not only to me, but to people around me. Not only to you, but people around you. And it's called sin. So Satan goes after us to ruin us internally so that we sin. We sin to take care of ourselves. We sin to protect ourselves. We sin to provide for ourselves. And, and, and it is a sin that affects me personally, but it is a sin that, that goes out for me into my relationships with how I interact with other people. That's what Satan is trying to do. He's trying to ruin. Ruin your marriage if you're married. Ruin your family, your relationship with kids or parents. Ruin relationships at work. Ruin relationships right here in our church. That's what he wants to do. So, so Satan's strategy is always to ruin something. Amen. Ruin you personally, ruin your relationships, because if you're ruined, you're not going to testify to God. Amen. You're not going to testify to the power of God. You, you're, you're not going to speak words that build others up. You're not going to speak words that, that draw the community together in unity. Amen. He's trying to ruin. And if he ruins you personally, internally, that's going to ruin your relationships. And a lot of people we're, we're looking at it can why is this relationship just such a mess? Well, they're ruined internally, you're ruined internally, <coughs> and you go hang out with each other. And what happens? Yeah, usually not much good. But that's what Satan is trying to do. He wants us to live an independent life. A life independent from God and independent from others. A life that does not trust God, a life that does not trust other people. Think about the story of Eve that Pastor Sam brought up last week, or a couple weeks ago. Um, Eve. Satan spoke a word to her. She believed it, and it was a word that she could live independently from God, that she could be an equal with God. She could know good and bad that God does. So, so he spoke a word not so that she could trust God more, but that she could trust herself more. That's independence. And 2,000 years after Christ, we're still living this independent life. We're living a life where we think, I can manage things on my own. I don't need others. I, in fact, I don't even need God. I, I, I get a paycheck. I can pay all my bills. And so we're living independently. And when you're living independently, you're not trusting. You're not trusting God. You're not trusting people around you. And that's what Satan is trying to do. He's wanting to isolate you so you feel lonely, so you feel... Uh, Uh, last week, Pastor Sam <clears throat> brought up the idea of the courtroom scene, because he's talking about how Satan goes after us to accuse us, and he says, it's kind of like being in a courtroom, and the prosecuting attorney is Satan, and, and, and you're on the defense, and he's, and he's pointing the finger at you and saying, last week, Tuesday, 
Last week, Tuesday, he spoke lies. Last week, Tuesday, he fudged the numbers at work. Last week, Tuesday, he did. And he's pointing the finger and trying to accuse you. He's the prosecuting attorney. Um, so th this courtroom scene, um, I, I, I want us to have a look at Romans chapter 8 for just a moment. I'm going to read a couple of verses here. Romans 8, 33. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? This is a courtroom scene where a charge is being brought against you. Who, would, who will bring a charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. In other words, he's the judge sitting on the, the, the judge's bench. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, and more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So this is a courtroom scene where, where Satan is bringing a charge against us. He's accusing us. He's condemning us. But we also read, God justifies. God is the judge. He's on the throne, and he justifies. And the word justify means to declare righteous. He declares you righteous. Who is he that condemns? That's Satan. He's trying to condemn you and say, look, God, look at what she did on Wednesday. Look at the words that she's spoken against her parents. He's, he's accusing and condemning. But Jesus, he intercedes for us. In other words, he's the defense attorney. He's standing with you, beside you, and he says, uh, Father, hold, hold on a minute, before Satan gets too far here, uh, let me show you my hands. Let me show you my feet. Let me show you my side. Look, look at the blood. I paid the debt. Yes, she said those things on Wednesday. Yes, you did those things on Tuesday. But my blood, Thank you. I paid the debt for their sin. I paid the debt. And it is the Father who justifies, who declares righteous. There is a verdict. And the verdict is justified. Justified. Satan's out to get us. Satan is wanting you to believe that every day you're living in the courtroom. But you're not. There once was a courtroom scene. But it's past. And the verdict is in. Jesus said, my blood, I, I paid the debt. Satan can accuse all he wants, but I've paid the debt. And that's where we live. We live in the testimony of what God has done. So the dominion of darkness is, is about the prince of darkness trying to tear you down, trying to ruin you, trying to ruin your relationships, get you living independently from God. Uh, but what about the kingdom of the sun? What is that about? Well, first of all, I want to look at the, the verb there. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. You see, God went into that dark dungeon. Jesus went down that dead-end alley. He went looking for you. He went looking for the ballerina. He went looking for me. He went looking and he found you. He found you where you were. And he rescued you. He delivered you. He took you from there and brought you into a new place. So rescued you from the dominion of darkness, from the, the dark dungeon, and brought us into the kingdom of his son. That, that verb there that brought us into is, is a verb that really means to, to cause a, a new change of state. So once you were in a state over here and you've been transported into a new state, you are now over here. You are no longer in the dark dungeon. You are no longer in the dead end alley. You've been transferred or transported by Jesus into a new kingdom, the kingdom of the sun. It's a kingdom of light. The darkness doesn't, it doesn't overtake you anymore. There is light that pushes back the darkness. And in this kingdom of the sun, there is redemption. And the word redemption means that a release has come because a ransom has been paid. Jesus says, yes, yes, they sinned, but I'll pay the debt. I'll pay the ransom for their sin. It's been paid. 
redemption. You have been redeemed. Yeah, you've done bad stuff. Yeah, we've sinned. But you've been redeemed. Jesus paid the debt. You've been ransomed. That's the good news. And along with the ransom being paid, there's also forgiveness. Forgiveness of sin. And the word forgiveness there means to send it away. Jesus takes the sin and like, oh yeah, I see it. And then he sends it away. It reminds me of uh, Psalm 103 verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far as God removed our transgressions from us. If you travel east, you're never going to hit the west. That's how far away it is. And Jesus removes it. He sends it away. That's the kingdom of the Son, whom he loves. You've been rescued from the dominion of darkness. You're no longer under the authority of the prince of darkness. You're no longer under the authority of accusations and lies and fear and intimidation. You're no longer there. You can just say, no. And you've been brought into the kingdom of the Son. Uh, let's go back to Romans 8 for just a moment. Uh, back to the, the courtroom scene. Verse uh, 31. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? So, so yeah, God is sitting on the throne, as, or, or, or sorry, in the judge's seat. He's judge, but he's for you. He's not against you. Satan is against you. Satan wants to accuse you, but God is for you. Um, uh, verse 35, jumping down a little bit. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Hmm. No situation in life, no matter difficult, no matter how difficult, how painful it is, no situation in life will ever separate you from the love of God in Christ. Nothing. You are loved. Nothing separates you. Uh, jumping down again to verse 37. No, in all these things, we are what? More than conquerors. What? More than conquerors. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. We're more than conquerors because I'm really skilled, right? We're more than conquerors because I'm, I'm really smart, right? We are more than conquerors because Pastor Sam is really good looking, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, we are more than conquerors because of Christ. Christ won the victory. He is victorious. Yes. Yeah, give him a round of applause. He's victorious. And because he is victorious, you are victorious. You are a conqueror. Uh, verse 38. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Except what you did on Tuesday, right? That lie you told on Tuesday, that separates you from the love of God, right? Does it? No. no. When you fudge the numbers at work on Wednesday, that separates you from the love of God, right? Yeah. Sorry, what was that? <laughs> oh, okay, we for the boss. Um, nothing, nothing separates you from the love of God. Not any sin you've ever committed. It does not separate you from the love of God. We have a loving God. All we got to do is say, yep, I messed up. Yep, I did that. Yep, I said that thing. Yep, I did that deed. Yep, I had those thoughts. Yes, I, I lusted after that. All we have to do is to say, yes, we need to take ownership of our sin. We're just honest and humble and say, yes, I did it. And Jesus says, yep, and my blood is sufficient to pay the debt of that sin. You are forgiven. The verdict is in. You are justified. You are declared righteous. Thank you. You see, love is powerful. God's love is strong. It can hold us. It can hold you through the hard times of life. Love is not just some sentiment. 
of the heart, of the, of the, the flutterings that you, you get when you see somebody who you think is kind of good looking. It, it, it's not that kind of emotional affection or a sentiment. The love of God is, is a strong experience, a strong move of God where he envelops you and holds you and assures you. Nothing can separate you from his love. Uh, I want to end by going back to the story of the ballerina. Her life was kind of ugly for quite a while, quite a lot of years through adulthood. But then one day, she's walking through the forest in a field, and she experienced God. Uh, her words were, uh, she was immersed in the sacred presence. Immersed in the sacred presence. She experienced God just washing over her. Um, a couple weeks ago, we sang this song, Drenched in Love. She got drenched. In that moment, she got drenched in the love of God. She got drenched by the very presence of God, immersed. And, and, she, and in that moment, she experienced assurance of her worth, that she's beautiful. She's a left foot. She's a right foot. She experienced something happening where she got released from that pain, released from the anxiety. She said it, it kind of slipped off of her. She experienced God washing away the despair, washing away the anger. Just, just all washed away. She's there in the presence of God. She met Jesus in a profound, personal way. And she is rescued from her dark dungeon. And she is transported into the kingdom of light, in the kingdom of Jesus. She experienced love. And the same is true of you. You are rescued and you are transferred into the kingdom of, of Jesus. You are rescued. Now, Satan doesn't want you to believe that. Satan wants you to, it is kind of okay with us this morning while we're together going, rah, 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 yeah, I believe that. But then as soon as we leave this place, he wants to come after you again and try to ruin you. And he wants to speak those lies again and accuse you. And he wants you to feel less than. And he's going to do that. But here's the truth. All we got to do is say no. That's right. No, Satan. That's a lie. I'm, and I don't believe lies. I believe truth. And the truth is, I'm rescued. Amen. I'm rescued from your authority, Satan. Amen. I'm no longer under your authority. Amen. 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 I'm no longer under your authority. I don't have to go along with your lies. I don't have to go along with your accusations. I don't have to allow your fear to, to intimidate me. I am released. Hallelujah. Redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Satan will bring up to you again and again the stuff of the past. He wants to try to trigger you. And all you got to do is say, no, no, Satan. I believe truth. I believe truth. This morning we're celebrating communion. And in communion we're remembering that Jesus died on the cross, rose again from the dead to pay the debt of our sin. Uh, last week, Pastor Sam referred to um, Revelation 12, verse 11, that um, we overcame by the blood of the Lamb the word of, his tes of their testimony. Well, when we celebrate communion, this is about the objective reality of what Jesus did for us through his death and resurrection. The blood of the Lamb paid the debt of sin. He is victorious, and so we are victorious. And so we have a testimony. We have a testimony because we've trusted. The moment you trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior is the moment that you experience all that we are talking about this morning. That you have been rescued and transferred. You've been drenched in love. You, you've been redeemed and forgiven. The moment you say, Jesus, I trust you. Jesus, I surrender to you. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. And so we have a testimony. And we overcome by our testimony. And Satan will come after us and we just say, no, Satan. I have a testimony. I've been redeemed. I've been redeemed. I've been rescued. I've been transferred. I'm in the kingdom of light. So I, I, I'm going to speak a prayer. And then we're going to uh, sing a song, Oh, the Blood of Jesus. And, and that's just going to kind of continue us into a, a time of, of, of prayer and meditation as we prepare our hearts to come to communion. And, and, and communion is a time where we experience the reality of Jesus, the reality of his death and resurrection, the reality of his body that was broken for us, the reality of his blood that was shed for us.
And we experience it in a way that's like, wow, wow, I'm redeemed. Let him pray. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, we give you thanks and praise that we are indeed redeemed. Oh, Father in heaven, we thank you that you are the judge and you justify us. You declare us righteous. We know our stuff. We know the way we've messed up. We know our sin. And this morning we just honestly come before you and say, yes, I have sinned. But thank you, Jesus, that you are our advocate. You are our defense attorney. You intercede for us. And your blood pays the debt for our sin. And we are declared righteous, justified. Oh, Holy Spirit, we just pray that this moment right now, you know each person here, you know the struggles, you know the, the, the inner videos that go on in each of our minds, kind of like the ballerina had these, these videos in her head. And you know the playbacks. Oh, Holy Spirit, right now in this moment, we just pray that you would, you would overwhelm each and every person here with your presence and speak words of assurance of the truth and the reality of Jesus, of his blood that washes away our sin. That we've been rescued and redeemed. Oh, Holy Spirit, right now, uh, you know each person here, you know what they're struggling with, you know what's going on in their mind, you know, you, you know the, 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 the lies that they've been believing, you know the, the way that Satan has been accusing them of something, and right now, Jesus, Holy Spirit, you are the spirit of truth, and you lead us into truth, and we just pray that in this moment, you'd speak your truth. Lead us into your truth.
And if you love Jesus with all of your heart, soul, and strength, if you believe that he's Lord and Savior, or if you've been baptized in the life of the church, you are welcome to participate in communion and receive these gifts of God that are for the people of God. We believe that Jesus is present right here. We believe that the Holy Spirit is present right here. We believe the Father is present here. And he's working in us this morning. And he wants to speak to you, to each of you. So uh, we'd like to invite the communion servers to, to come up, and uh, they, they will distribute the, the communion element. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is my body, it's been broken for you. Every time you eat it, do it in remembrance of me. And so I, I know it's a little finicky to open up your little thing there and only get the cracker part, but I invite you to do that and get your cracker in. And as you're holding on to it, just think about, like, what, what, what is one of the, the videotapes that play in your head? What, what are some of the, the lies or accusations that Satan has been speaking to you, maybe recently or maybe through life, just feelings of less than or unworthy? And, and just think about that for a moment. And um, Jesus' body was crushed for you, for your sin. And Jesus' body, his death and resurrection, crushes that lie. Jesus crushes that lie. Fear. Jesus crushes that sin. Jesus crushes that accusation. Jesus crushes it. So just take a moment and, and look at it. Just like, yeah. 
Jesus is crushing it. The bread which you break is a participation in the body of Christ. Let us eat together. In the same night, he took the wine and thanks, and he gave it to the disciples, and he invited each of them to drink of it, and said, this is my blood, the blood of the New Testament, which was poured out for the remission of sins, it's many. Pastor Brian pointed out, as John recorded, Revelation 12, we overcome the blood. This is how we become more than conquerors. So the blood of the Lamb, the blood that Jesus shed. In the courtroom, when we were accused, this is the evidence that was presented yes. in our behalf that declared us righteous, the blood of the Lamb. So if Move the next layer in the cup for those of you who are here present. Oh, I'm sorry, Let's partake of the blood. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. So, God, we just thank you for the price you paid. our freedom. Amen. We're no longer bound to fear or anything related to the kingdom of darkness. Amen. You have brought us into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of your son, Jesus. Amen. And so God, we thank you for that and we're asking you to help us to Walk that out every day of our lives. Let it become, living in the light, become our daily reality. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, Pastor Brian was talking about the fact that we, we, we have a testimony as a result of what Christ did. And we learned that not only do we overcome by the blood that Jesus shed, but we also overcome by the word of our testimony, or that which comes out of our mouth. And we want to call on us a few minutes uh, because I'm convinced that there is some folk here that have testimonies, stories of what God has done, God's redemption, uh, God's overcoming power in their life. There are stories of where you once were bound or enslaved to fear or whatever, and God has freed you. Somebody needs to hear that. Perhaps somebody present, perhaps somebody that's viewing virtually, that needs to hear your story, because your story and what God did in you may be the very thing that helps them to overcome. So for a few minutes, we may not, now, you won't be able to tell all your stories, or perhaps everything about a story, but just come and share briefly what God has done. We, 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 we're gonna do this in a few minutes, and I, I want you to just come quickly. Remember, my kid, there's no particular order that you need to come in, but uh, somebody needs to hear your story. And most, and, and, and not only does it help someone else, but it's bringing God glory. So, come share your story. Even this morning, 
being bound with fear. Whenever I am assigned to pray, there's a spirit of fear that comes over me like you guys would never believe. I feel so afraid of coming before the people of God and praying when it's my turn. Now, I don't have, I don't have a hard time praying any other time. Somebody calls and say pray, I can pray. But for some reason, when, it's, when I'm assigned to pray here, the spirit of fear grips me so that I'm like, I don't even want to come to church. Like, I'm literally trying to figure out ways of getting out of coming to church without lying. Um, <laughs> even this morning. But then I had to remind myself of the word of God. God has not given me the spirit of fear. Amen. But a power, love, and a sound mind. Now, can you get up, get your clothes on, because you have an assignment today. Um, I was assigned to greet, um, also to pray with the leaders, and also to pray before you, the body of Christ, here in this building, as well as on, online. So I was like, okay, I have an assignment. God, you have chosen me for this. So I'm not backing down. I'm not, I'm not cowardly. I'm not going to stand behind. I'm no longer going to, um, today, allow fear to grip me, like paralyze me. That's good. So I had to tell myself the word of God. And, and when they said, you can say no, and I had to say that, no, no. God has not given me the spirit of fear. So even today, guys, it's like, it's not like, once you're saved, he goes away. It's not like once you're saved, the fear goes away, the struggles go, goes away. No, but it's the word of God that backs the devil up off of you. Got a few more minutes. Anyone else? You had the devil talking in your ear and you had to say no. Come on. Somebody needs to hear your story. Listening to Dana as well as Kenya, uh, I'm hoping that you, you're encouraged to know that even when Satan shows up, however he shows up, you can say no. You can 
resist, you can resist him, and that literally means to speak out against him. Uh, uh, we walk in submission to God, and he has instructed us, submit therefore to him, resist the devil, he'll free, he'll flee rather. And uh, it comes with depression, but you, you sang with joy this morning. So that means he did not, he was unsuccessful. Somewhere you said no. Comes with fear, but you prayed under the power of the Holy Spirit this morning. Somewhere you said no. We have the authority over him, not the other way around. All right. God bless you. Thank you for sharing today. Uh, and uh, we're going to release you. Worship team is going to come and, and, and sing us out. If I can use that expression. You have that song that you want to sing. What song? Oh, yeah, that's right. Is that right now? Yes. Oh, yeah. Awesome. <laughs>
and we will walk in freedom throughout this week. We will walk in the light. We will experience the liberating power of God manifesting in our lives throughout this week. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Go and be in peace. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.